Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, my number four, all ready? And then we'll be out of here, and uh, now don't forget, we'll be taping again next week, those of you here in the studio. For those of you out in television, again, we just want to welcome you to a Bible study. We just keep it plain and simple. I don't claim to have all the answers, but uh, hopefully we can prove what we say with Scripture, because after all, what man thinks means nothing, whether it's myself or someone else, but what does the book say? All right, we're back in Revelation chapter 1. We'll keep right on going where we left off, which will be in verse 6 now. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. And remember now, he's writing to Jews primarily. We gain from it, of course we do, but it is written to Jewish believers in view of the coming tribulation. All right, verse 6, And he hath made us Jews, kings, and priests unto God his Father, to him be glory and dominion. All right, now many of you already know where I can go to prove that point, that this is all Jewish. Go back to Exodus chapter 19. And you see, Paul never uses that term. Never. So if Paul doesn't use it, but all the Jewish writers do, then what does that show? <laughs> that it's for the Jew. It's for Israel. And you can't mix the two. The more I study, the more convinced I am. They can call me what they will, but you cannot mix God's dealing with Israel, His earthly people, with the body of Christ, His heavenly people. And you've got that distinction all the way through. See? All right, Exodus 19. Now, just to show you that this is a called-out assembly, drop in with me from... Verse 3, Exodus 19, verse 3. They've come out of Egypt through the Red Sea, and they're gathered around Mount Sinai. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, that is, Mount Sinai. And he says, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now stop and think. Is there anything in there that involves a Gentile? Nothing. This is God dealing with Israel. All right? Verse 4. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, that is, drowned them in the Red Sea, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself, brought them through the Red Sea, out around Mount Sinai. Now verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and if you will keep my covenant, then you, the nation, shall be a peculiar, now remember I'm always stressing that word means something of intrinsic value, then you shall be an intrinsic treasure unto me above all people. And the reason he can say that, he's sovereign, for all the earth is mine. Now look at verse 6. And you, Israel, the nation, shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. Now, do you see how that's almost word for word what John just said in Revelation? All right, but let's go all the way up and see how Peter puts it in his little epistle. Jump all the way up now to 1 Peter, and he uses the same identical language. And in fact, you can keep your hand in Exodus 19 and just flip back and forth and see how identical these words are. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And Peter is writing under the same circumstances that I feel John is. Verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But, Peter says, you, and remember he's writing to Jews, just like Exodus was. You are a chosen generation, a royal what? Priesthood. A holy nation. 
Now the word holy simply means set apart for God's purposes. They were a set apart people for God's purposes. A peculiar people. See? That's exact language. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's how Peter puts it. All right, come back again to Revelation, and John says almost exactly the same thing that he hath made us, Jews, the believing element of Israel. He hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father to be glory and dominion forever. All right, now verse 7. Behold, John writes, he, the Messiah, the Son, the returning Christ, behold, he cometh with what? Clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now let's just back up one page first, just to Jude. Verse 14, the little book of Jude, verse 14. And Enoch also, Jude writes, way back there in Genesis, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Verse 15, to execute what? Judgment. See? His second coming will be associated with the final destruction of the Gentile world and a judgment upon all and to convince all who are ungodly and so on and so forth. All right, back to Revelation now again. So verse 7, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Now that's not going to happen at the rapture. The world isn't going to see the rapture take place. It's just going to be a sudden silent disappearance they're not going to see Christ as he has come to the air. But here, he's ready to come all the way to the planet Earth. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And the prophecy is that every eye shall see him, and they also who pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. All right, the piercing then, we have to really go back to Zechariah. Come back again to the Old Testament. And again, I want you to realize that these are all Old Testament references, which ties it all to the nation of Israel. Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. The exact language. And how can anybody separate what God says to Israel in the Old Testament prophets from what he's saying to Israel from the words of the Apostle John. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, where God says through the prophet now, I will pour upon the house of David. That's not a Gentile term, that's Israel. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they, the house of Israel, shall, or the house of David, the nation of Israel, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his firstborn. Well, now there's another beautiful illustration in the Old Testament of a family mourning over a great joyful reunion. And you all know what it is, don't you? Joseph. All right, let's come all the way back. All the way back to Genesis. And pick up Joseph being reunited with his brethren. Chapter 45 of Genesis. Oh, there's so much here, I'm going to have to delete some or we'll run out of time again, as we're prone to do. 
But uh, here in Genesis 45, let's just start at verse 1, and then we'll hit just a few of the pertinent verses. Now remember what we're talking about, that every eye will see him as he's returning at his second coming, primarily to deal and confirm and fulfill all the promises made to the Old Testament prophets, and there will be a great mourning, tears of joy, really, when they see and recognize their Messiah. All right, but here's a picture of it. Chapter 45 of Genesis, verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren, the ones that had sold him into slavery. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. But now as you go through all this, Joseph sets them at ease. Verse 5, Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. That was all part of the purposes of God. That Joseph would have to be in Egypt to gather the grain that would help everyone to survive during the seven years of famine. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Now verse 6. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five more, in the which there shall be neither earring nor harvest. God sent me, verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So it wasn't you that sent me hither, but God. And now you come on down to verse 13. And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, and you shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and what? Wept. Well, not tears of remorse, but tears of what? Joy. See? Joy unspeakable. Now verse 15. He didn't limit it to Benjamin. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. And so it was that great joyful reunion between Joseph and the estranged brethren. Well, so it'll be when Christ returns to the Mount of Olives and will finally be accepted by his covenant people, Israel. All right, back to Revelation, chapter 1 again. Now verse 8. Revelation 1, now verse 8. Now the Lord is speaking through the Apostle John, and he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first letter in the alphabet, the last letter in the alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, who is, who was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Now, if you start making a study of this book of Revelation, you will find that John uses the same terms of deity that the Old Testament uses, but that Paul does not. And there again is that graphic difference. This is all Jewish. Paul never refers to, for example, just an example, Paul never uses the term the Son of Man. Did you know that? But all the rest of Scripture that's Jewish will constantly refer to Christ or God the Son as the Son of Man. See? Paul never does. That's just one. But now let's go back to Isaiah. And uh, let's see. I want to go back first to Isaiah chapter... I think I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41, let's see, verse 4. Isaiah 31, 41, verse 4. How all of this ties together with the Old Testament. John, the Jewish writer, 
writing to Jews. Isaiah, the Jewish prophet, writing to Jews. And they say basically the same thing. Isaiah 41, verse 4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord. And we're going to look a minute, see who that is. I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. Got that? All right, now come all the way back. Keep your hand in Isaiah. We're coming back here in a little bit. Come all the way back to Exodus again. Chapter 3. Portion that you're all well acquainted with. I hope you are anyway. You should be. Exodus, chapter 3. The burning bush. The burning bush. And Moses is taken by it, that it's burning, and yet it's not being consumed. And so he comes to the burning bush, and the Lord speaks out of the bush, verse 5. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, the burning bush, moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon who? God. So who's the burning bush? God. All right, move on down. All the way through, it's a constant reference to the Lord and to God. All right, now then, verse 13. And Moses said unto God, there at the burning bush, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say, What is his name? What's the name of this God you're talking about? Moses says, What shall I say to them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. See how plain that is? And this is the Lord. This is God the Son speaking. We refer to him as Joseph, uh, Jehovah, and Adonai, and the Almighty, which is what I'm going to have you look at next. Come back to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now, these were all Old Testament terms concerning the Son. None of which, if I'm not mistaken, Paul uses. He does not use these same terms of deity. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us, and I'm always emphasizing, who are the us? Israel. This isn't talking to the world in general. This is talking to the nation of Israel. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And now we jump all the way up to the millennial reign. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Consular, the Mighty God. See, the same term that John uses, the Mighty God. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And the government sh and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David. See how the scripture constantly emphasizes that when Christ returns to set up this kingdom, he will rule from David's throne in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. All right, now then to... Take a little further take on the I am of Exodus 3. Go up to John's Gospel now. John's Gospel, chapter 8. Most of you know where I'm going. John's Gospel, chapter 8. And for sake of time, we'll just go all the way down to verse 51. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 51. All got it? Christ's earthly ministry. Jesus is speaking. 
And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews, See, the, it's amongst his earthly ministry. No Gentiles here. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a demon. Abraham is dead. The prophets, they're dead. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? Repeat the question, are you greater than the prophets? They're dead. Who makest thou thyself? And Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom you say he is your God. Yet you have not known him, that is, their God. But I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like you. Quite a statement, wasn't it? But I know him, and I keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, that is, through the eyes of faith, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Now you pick up the scoffing. You're not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Can't you just see the smirk on their face? Come on. What are you trying to do? You can't fool us. Abraham lived 2,000 years ago, and you're telling us you've seen him? Now look at Jesus' answer. Verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, who? I am. You see what he's showing them? That he was the I am of the Old Testament deity. He was the Jehovah God of Abraham. He was the pre-eternal creator. He was the God of everything. And he made no apology for making those claims. All right, now let's come back again to Revelation then and see how the Apostle John can just pick up on all these things concerning this Christ who is now about to return as King of kings and Lord of lords once the horrors of the wrath and vexation have unfolded. All right, now verse 9. I, John, who also am your what? Brother. Now, spiritually, of course. Racially, yes. He's just as much a Jew as the Jews to whom he's writing. I am your brother. I'm a companion in what? Tribulation. They were all under the same pressure. Now, you've got to remember, these Jews to whom these men are writing, Peter, James, and John, were already under a lot of persecution even before the tribulation began. They were under pressure from the Orthodox Judaizers. They were under pressure from the pagan Romans. So they knew what persecution was. And so John could say, I can commiserate with you. I too am a companion in your tribulation. And in the kingdom, that is the kingdom promises that they're all waiting for and patience of Jesus Christ. All right, now go back to the subject of the sentence. I, John, was in the isle that is called Patmos. Iris and I were there a few years ago, and I imagine some of the rest of you have been there, a little island off the coast of Greece. And, uh, yeah, and just kind of hard to comprehend some of these things. But here he was on the island of Patmos, a little off the mainland, not off of Greece, off of western Turkey. I'm sorry. Now, he says, for the word of God. Now, the speculation is that it was a means of house arrest or persecution, but not all historians agree with that. It may have been a normal life for John on the island of Patmos. There isn't anything to indicate that he was under intense persecution at this time, but he may have been. But whatever, he's on the island of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, now verse 10. 
This has been so twisted out of shape, it's unbelievable. I was in the Spirit, that is, under the control of the Spirit of God, on the Lord's Day. That's not Sunday. That's what everybody thinks, that this was a Sunday and that he was writing this. No. What is the day of the Lord in Scripture? Tribulation. Tribulation. So what's he saying? That miraculously the Spirit of God is transporting him into the tribulation so he can write about it in the first person. He knew what he was writing. He was experiencing it in the realm of the Spirit, not writing on the island of Patmos on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> no, he is being now transported into the day of the Lord, and that term, the day of the Lord, throughout all the Old Testament, throughout the Jewish epistles, is always a reference to the seven years of the tribulation. Never forget that. All right, I haven't got time enough to go to on into another, nurse, another verse, but here it's as plain as die that has he's in the Spirit in this transformed day of the Lord so he can write about it with firsthand experience. He experiences the voice behind him as a trumpet. And so we go on from there, and we'll pick this up in our next program where this voice is again the voice of the Lord Jesus himself. And so what we have to realize that as we go into the further prophecy of Revelation, this is John writing with almost a first-hand graphic view of all the events that will be taking place leading up to the return of their Messiah, the establishing of that glorious earthly kingdom promised to Israel ever since Abraham, but then especially since David, and all the way up through the prophets. Now, I've emphasized it in my teaching wherever I go. You know, there were two aspects of the Lord's coming that Israel had to be aware of. He had to come first as a suffering redeemer, and then he would come as a ruling and reigning king. But their problem was they couldn't separate the two. They couldn't understand how one Messiah could be both a suffering Savior, but also a ruling and a glorious King. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Veldick.